Scene 1. Mrs. Summers, Mr. Willis Campbell. Mrs. Amy Summers, in a lightly floating tea gown of singularly becoming texture and color, employs the last moments of expectance before the arrival of her guests in marching up and down in front of the mirror which fills the space between the long windows of her drawing room, looking over either shoulder for different effects of the drifting and eddying train, and advancing upon her image with certain little bobs and bows, and retreating from it with a variety of fan practice and elaborated curtsies, finally degenerating into burlesque, and a series of grimaces and mouths made at the responsive reflex. In the fascination of this amusement, she is first ignorant, and then aware of the presence of Mr. Willis Campbell, who on the landing space between the drawing-room and the library stands, hat in hand, in the pleased contemplation of Mrs. Summers' maneuvers and contortions as the mirror reports them to him. Mrs. Summers does not permit herself the slightest start on seeing him in the glass, but turns deliberately away, having taken time to prepare the air of gratification and surprise with which she greets him at half the length of the drawing-room. Mrs. Summers giving her hand. Why, Mr. Campbell, how very nice of you! How long have you been prowling about there on the landing? So stupid of them not to have turned up the gas. I wasn't much incommoded. That sort of pitch darkness is rather becoming to my style of beauty, I find. The only objection was that I couldn't see you. Do you often make those pretty speeches? When I confound them on fact. What can I say back? Oh, that I'm sorry I couldn't have met you when you were looking your best. Oh, do you think you could have borne it? We might go out there. On second thoughts, no. I shall ring to have them turn up the gas. No, let me. He prevents her ringing, and going out into the space between the library and the drawing-room, stands with his hand on the key of the gas burner. Now, how do I look? Beautiful. Campbell, turning up the gas. And now? Not half so well. Decidedly, pitch darkness is becoming to you. Better turn it down again. Campbell, rejoining her in the drawing-room. No, it isn't so becoming to you, and I'm not envious, whatever I am. You are generosity itself. If you come to phrases, I prefer magnanimity. Well, say magnanimity. Won't you sit down while you have the opportunity? She sinks upon the sofa and indicates with her fan an easy chair at one end of it, Campbell dropping into it. Are there going to be so many? You never can tell about five o'clock tea. There mayn't be more than half a dozen. There may be thirty or forty. But I wish to affect your imagination. You had better have tried it in some other kind of weather. It's snowing like... Mrs. Summers running to the window and peeping out through the side of the curtain. It is, like cats and dogs. Oh, no, you can't say that. It only rains that way. I was going to say it myself, but I stopped in time. Mrs. Summers standing before the window with clasped hands. No matter. There will simply be nobody but bores. They come in any sort of weather. Thank you, Mrs. Summers. I'm glad I ventured out. Mrs. Summers turning about. What? Then realizing the situation. Oh, poor Mr. Campbell. Oh, don't mind me. I can stand it if you can. I belong to a sex, thank you, that doesn't pretend to have any tact. I would just as soon tell a man he was a bore as not. But I thought it might worry a lady, perhaps. Worry? I'm simply aghast at it. Did you ever hear of anything worse? Well, not much worse. What can I do to make you forget it? 
i can't think of anything it seems to me that i shall always remember it as the most fortunate speech a lady ever made to me and they have said some flattering things to me in my time oh don't be entirely heartless wouldn't a cup of tea blot it out with a piquant freen she advances beseechingly upon him come i will give you a cup at once no thank you i would rather have it with the rest of the bores they'll be sure to come mrs somers resuming her seat on the sofa you are implacable and i thought you said you were generous no merely magnanimous i can't forget your cruel frankness but i know you can and i ask you to do it he throws himself back in his chair with a sigh <sighs> and who knows perhaps you were right about what my being a bore i should think you would know no that's the difficulty nobody would be a bore if he knew it oh some would i think do you mean me well no then i don't believe you would be a bore if you knew it is that enough or do you expect me to say something more no it's quite enough thank you he remains pensively silent Mrs. Summers, after waiting for him to speak. Bores for bores. Don't you hate the silent ones most? Campbell, desperately rousing himself. Mrs. Summers, if you only knew how disagreeable I was going to make myself just before I concluded to hold my tongue. Really? What were you going to say? Do you actually wish to know? oh no i only thought you wished to tell not at all you complained of my being silent did i i was wrong i will never do so again she laughs in her fan and i complain of your delay you can tell me now just as well as two weeks hence whether you love me enough to marry me or not you promised not to recur to that subject without some hint from me you have broken your promise well you wouldn't give me any hint how can i believe you care for me if you are false in this it seems to me that my falsehood is another proof of my affection very well then you can wait till i know my mind i'd rather know your heart but i'll wait why do you carry a fan on a day like this i ask to make a general conversation mrs summers spreading the fan in her lap and looking at it curiously i don't know oh yes for the same reason that i shall have ice cream after dinner today that's no reason at all are you going to have ice cream today after dinner i might if i had company oh i couldn't stay after hinting i'm too proud for that he pulls his chair nearer and joins her in examining the fan in her lap what is so very strange about your fan nothing I was just seeing how a fan looked that was the subject of gratuitous criticism. I didn't criticise the fan. He regards it studiously. Oh, not the fan. No, I think it's extremely pretty. I like big fans. So good of you. It's Spanish. That's why it's so large it's hand-painted too mrs summers leaning back and leaving him to the inspection of the fan you're a connoisseur mr campbell 
oh i can tell hand painting from machine painting when i see it it isn't so good thank you not at all now that fellow cavalier i suppose in spain making love in that attitude you can see at a glance that he's hand painted no machine painted cavalier would do it in that way and look at the lady's hand who ever saw a hand of that size before mrs summers unclasping the hands which she had folded at her waist and putting one of them out to take up the fan you said you were not criticising the fan campbell quickly seizing the hand with the fan in it ah i'm wrong here's another one no bigger let me see which is the largest mrs summers struggling not very violently to free her hand mr campbell don't take it away you must listen to me now amy mrs summers rising abruptly and dropping her fan as she comes forward to meet an elderly gentleman arriving from the landing mr bemis how very heroic of you to come such a day isn't it too bad scene two mr bemis mrs summers mr willis campbell not if it makes me specially welcome mrs summers discovering campbell oh mr campbell campbell striving for his self-possession as they shake hands yes another hero mr bemis mrs summers is going to brevet everybody who comes to-day she didn't say heroes to me but you shall have your tea at once mr bemis she rings i was making mr campbell wait for his you don't order up the teapot for one hero <laughs> no indeed but i'm very glad you do for two the fact is i'm half frozen is it so very cold to campbell who presents her fan with a bow oh thank you to mr bemis mr campbell has just been objecting to my fan he doesn't like its being hand painted as he calls it that reminds me of a californian gentleman whom i found looking at an andrea del sarto in the pity palace at florence one day by the way you've been a californian too mr campbell but you won't mind he seemed to be puzzled over it and then he said to me i was standing near him hand painted i presume <laughs> how very good to the maid who appears the tea lizzie you don't think he was joking why no it never occurred to me that he was you can't always tell when a californian's joking can't you not even adoptive ones adoptive ones never joke not even about hand-painted fans what an interesting fact she sits down on the sofa behind the little table on which the maid arranges the tea and pours out a cup then with her eyes on mr bemis cream and sugar both yes holding a cube of sugar in the tongs how many one please mrs summers handing it to him i'm so glad you take your tea au naturel as i call it what do you call it when they don't take it with cream and sugar oh unnatural there's only one thing worse taking it with a slice of lemon in it you might as well draw it from a bothersome samovar at once and be done with it the samovar is picturesque it is insincere like californians natives well i can think of something much worse than tea with lemon in it what no tea at all mrs summers recollecting herself oh poor mr campbell two lumps 
one thank you your pity is so sweet you ought to have thought of the milk of human kindness and spared my cream jug too you didn't pour out your compassion soon enough bemus who has been sipping his tea in silent admiration are you often able to keep it up in that way i was fancying myself at the theatre oh don't encore us mr campbell would keep saying his things over indefinitely campbell presenting his cup another lump it's turned bitter two <laughs> very good very good indeed thank you kindly mr bemis mrs summers greeting the new arrivals and leaning forward to shake hands with them as they come up without rising mrs roberts how very good of you and mr roberts scene three mr and mrs roberts and the others not at all of course we were coming will you have some tea you see i'm installed already mr campbell was so greedy he wouldn't wait mr bemis and i are here in the character of heroes and we had to have our tea at once you're a hero too roberts though you don't look it any one who comes to tea in such weather is a hero or a mrs summers interrupting him with a little shriek oh how hot that handle's getting i dare say let me turn out my sister's cup pouring out the tea and handing it to mrs roberts i don't see how you could reconcile it to your number eleven conscience to leave your children in such a snowstorm as this agnes mrs roberts in vague alarm why what in the world could happen to them willis oh nothing to them but suppose roberts got snowed under have some tea roberts he offers to pour out a cup mrs summers dispossessing him of the teapot with dignity thank you mr campbell i will pour out the tea oh very well i thought the handle was hot it's cooler now and you won't let me help you when there are more people you may hand the tea i wish i knew just how much that meant very little as little as an adoptive californian in his most earnest mood while they talk campbell bending over the teapot on which mrs summers keeps her hand the others form a little group apart bemis to mrs roberts i hope mr roberts distinguished friend won't give us the slip on account of the storm oh no he'll be sure to come he may be late but he's the most amiable of englishmen and i know he won't disappoint mrs summers the most unamiable of englishmen couldn't do that ah i don't know did you meet mr pogus no what did he do why he came to the hibbins dinner in a sack coat i thought it was a cardigan jacket i heard a norfolk jacket and knickerbockers ah there is mrs kerwin to campbell aside and without her husband or anyone else's husband for shame you began it mrs summers to mrs kerwin who approaches her sofa you are kindness itself mrs kerwin to come on such a day the ladies press each other's hands scene four mrs kerwin and the others you are goodness in person mrs summers to say so and i am magnanimity embodied let me introduce myself mrs kerwin he bows and mrs kerwin deeply curtsies i should never have known you campbell melodramatically to mrs summers tea ho for mrs kerwin impenetrably disguised as kindness what shall i say to him mrs summers pouring the tea anything you 
like Mrs. Kerwin. Aren't we to see Mr. Kerwin today? Mrs. Kerwin taking her tea. No, I'm his insufficient apology. He's detained at his office. Business. Then you see they don't all come, Mrs. Summers. All what? Oh, all the heroes. Is that what he was going to say, Mrs. Summers? You never can tell what he's going to say. I should think you would be afraid of him. Mrs. Summers with a little shrug. Oh, no, he's quite harmless. It's just a little way he has. To Mr. and Mrs. Miller, Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Bemis, and Dr. Lawton, who all appear together. Ah, how do you do? So glad to see you. So very kind of you. I didn't suppose you would venture out. And you too, Doctor. She begins to pour out tea for them, one after another, with great zeal. Scene 5. Dr. Lawton, Mr. and Mrs. Miller, young Mr. and Mrs. Bemis, and the others. Yes, I too. It sounded very much as if I were Brutus also. He stirs his tea and stares round at the company. It seems to me that I have met these conspirators before. That's what makes Boston insupportable. You're always meeting the same people. We all feel it as keenly as you do, Doctor. Lawton looking sharply at him. Oh, you here? I might have expected it. Where is your aunt? Scene 6. Mrs. Crashaw and the others. Mrs. Crashaw appearing. If you mean me, Dr. Lawton. I do, my dear friend. What company is complete without you? Mrs. Summers reaching forward to take her hand while with her disengaged hand she begins to pour her a cup of tea. None in my house. Very pretty. Taking her tea. I hope it isn't complete either without the English painter you promised us. No, indeed. And a great many other people besides. But haven't you met him yet? I supposed Mrs. Roberts. Oh, I don't go to all of Agnes's Fandigos. I was to have seen him at Mrs. Wheeler's. He is being asked everywhere, of course. But he didn't come. He sent his father and mother instead. They were very nice old people, but they hadn't painted his pictures. They might say his pictures would never have been painted without them. It was like Highness going to visit Rachel by appointment. She wasn't in, but her father and mother were. And when he met her afterward, he told her that he had just come from a show where he had seen a curious monster advertised for exhibition. The offspring of a hare and a salmon. The monster was not to be seen at the moment, but the showman said, Here was Monsieur the Hare and Madame the Salmon. What in the world did Rachel say? Ah, uh, that's what these brilliant anecdotes never tell. And I think it would be very interesting to know what the victim of a witticism has to say. I should think you would know very often, Doctor. Ah, now I should like to know what the victim of a compliment says. He bows his thanks. Dr. Lawton makes a profound obeisance to which Mrs. Kerwin responds in burlesque. We all envy you, Doctor. Oh, yes. Mrs. Kerwin never makes a compliment without meaning it. I can't say that quite, my dear. I should be very sorry to mean all the civil things I say, but I never flatter gentlemen of a certain age. Mrs. Miller tittering ineffectively. I shall know what to say to Mr. Miller after this. Well, if you haven't got the man, Mrs. Summers, you have got his picture, haven't you? Yes, it's on my writing desk in the library. Let me... No, no, don't disturb yourself. We wish to tear it to pieces without your embarrassing presence. Will you take my arm, Mrs. Crashaw? Oh, let us all go and see it. Aren't you coming, Willis? Campbell, without looking round. Thank you, I've seen it. Mrs. Summers, whom the withdrawal of her other guests has left alone with him. How could you tell such a fib? 
i could tell much worse fibs than that in such a cause what cause a lost one i'm afraid will you answer my question amy did you ask me any you know i did before those people came in oh that yes i should like to ask you a question first twenty if you like why do you feel authorised to call me by my first name because i love you now will you answer me i didn't say i would did i Campbell rising sadly. No. Mrs. Summers mechanically taking the hand he offers her. Oh, what? I'm going, that's all. So soon? Yes, but I'll try to make amends by not coming back soon, or at all. You mustn't. Mustn't what? You mustn't keep my hand. Here come some more people. Ah, Mrs. Canfield, Miss Bailey. So very nice of you, Mrs. Wharton. Will you have some tea? Scene 7. Mrs. Campbell, Miss Bailey, Mrs. Wharton, and the others. No, thank you. The only objection to afternoon tea is the tea. I'm so glad you don't mind the weather. With her hand on the teapot, glancing up at Miss Bailey. And do you refuse too? I can answer for Mrs. Canfield that she doesn't and I never do. We object to the weather. Mrs. Summers pouring a cup of tea. That makes it a little more difficult. I can keep from offering Mrs. Wharton some tea, but I can't stop it snowing. Miss Bailey taking her cup. But you're so amiable. We know you would if you could, and that's quite enough. We're not the first and only, are we? Dear, no. There are multitudes of flattering spirits in the library, stopping the mouth of my portrait with pretty speeches. Not your Bramford portrait. My Bramford portrait. Miss Bailey to the other ladies. Oh, let us go and see it too. They flutter out of the drawing-room, where Mrs. Summers and Campbell remain alone together as before. He continues silent, while she waits for him to speak. Scene 8 Mrs. Summers, Mr. Campbell Mrs. Summers, finally. Well? Well what? Nothing. Only I thought you were... you were going to... No, I've got nothing to say. I didn't mean that. I thought you were going to go. She puts up her hand and hides a triumphant little smile with it. Very well, then, I'll go, since you wish it. He holds out his hand. Mrs. Summers putting hers behind her. You've shaken hands once. Besides, who said I wished you to go? Do you wish me to stay? I wish you to hand tea to people. And you won't say anything more? It seems to me that's enough. It isn't enough for me. But I suppose beggars mustn't be choosers. I can't stay merely to hand tea to people, however. You can say yes or no now, Amy, as well as any other time. Well, no, then, if you wish it so much. You know I don't wish it. You gave me my choice. I thought you were indifferent about the word. You know better than that, Amy. Amy, again? Aren't you a little previous, Mr. Campbell? Campbell with a sigh. Ah, that's for you to say. Wouldn't it be impolite? Oh, not for you. If you're so sarcastic, I shall be afraid of you. Under what circumstances? Mrs. Summers dropping her eyes. I don't know. He makes a rush upon her. Oh, here comes Mrs. Cowan. Shake hands as if you were going. 
Scene 9 Mrs. Kerwin, Mrs. Summers, Mr. Campbell What, is Mr. Campbell going too? To? You're not going, Mrs. Kerwin? Yes, I'm going. The likeness is perfect, Mrs. Summers. It's a speaking likeness if there ever was one. Did it do all the talking? It would if Mrs. Roberts and Dr. Lawton hadn't been there. Well, I must go. So must I. Must you? Yes, these drifts will be over my ears directly. You poor man! You don't mean to say you're walking. I shall be in about half a minute. Indeed you shall not. You shall be driving. With me. I've a vacancy in the coupé, and I'll set you down wherever you like. Won't it crowd you? Not at all. Or incommode you in any way? It will oblige me in every way. Then I will go, and a thousand thanks. Good-bye again, Mrs. Summers. Good-bye, Mrs. Summers. Poor Mrs. Summers. It seems too bad to leave you here alone, bowed in an elegic attitude over your tea-urn. Oh, not at all. Remember me to Mr. Cohen. I will. Well, Mr. Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Well? To which? Both. Neither. <laughs> Mr. Campbell, do you know much about women? I had a mother. Oh, a mother won't do. Well, I have an only sister who is a woman. A sister won't do either. Not your own. You can't learn a woman's meaning in that way. I will sit at your feet, Mrs. Kerwin, if you'll instruct me. I shall be delighted. I'll begin now. Oh, you needn't really prostrate yourself. She stops him in a burlesque attempt to do so. And I'll concentrate the wisdom of the whole first lesson in a single word. Campbell with clasped hands of entreaty. Speak, blessed ghost. Stay. <laughs> she flies at Mrs. Summers and kisses her. You can't say I'm ill-natured, my dear, whatever I am. Mrs. Summers pursuing her exit with the word. No, merely atrocious. A pause ensues in which Campbell stands irresolute. Scene 10. Mrs. Summers, Mr. Campbell. Campbell, finally. Did you wish me to stay, Amy? Mrs. Summers, airily. I? Oh, no, it was Mrs. Cohen. Then I think I'll accept her kind offer of a seat in her coupé. Oh, I thought, of course, you'd stay at her request. No, I shall only stay at yours. And I shall not ask you. In fact, I warn you not to. Why? Because if you urge me to speak now, I shall say... I wasn't going to urge you. No matter. I shall say it now without being urged. Yes, I've made up my mind. I can't marry a flirt. I can, Amy. Sir! You know very well you sent those people into the other room to keep me here and torment me. Now you've insulted me, and all is over. To tantalise me with your loveliness, your beauty, your grace, Amy. Mrs. Summers softening. Oh, that's all very well. I'm glad you like it. I could go on at much greater length. But you know I love you dearly, Amy, and why should you delight in my agonies? But only marry me, and you shall delight in them as long as you live. And— You must hold me very cheap to think I would take you from that creature. Confound her! I wasn't hers to give. I offered myself first. She offered you last, and no thank you, please. 
do you really mean it i shall not say or yes i will say if that woman who seems to have you at her beck and call had not intermeddled i might have made you a very different answer but now my eyes are opened and i see what i should have to expect and no thank you please and if she hadn't offered me mrs summers drawing out her handkerchief and putting it to her eyes i was feeling kindly toward you i was such a little fool amy and you knew how much i disliked her yes i saw by the way you kissed each other nonsense you knew that meant nothing but if it had been anybody else in the world but her i shouldn't have minded it and now 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 all these geese are coming back from the other room and they'll see that i've been crying and everybody will know everything willis <gasps> willis let me go i must bathe my eyes you stay here and receive them i'll be back at once she escapes from the arms stretched toward her and out of the door just before her guests enter from the library and campbell remains to receive them the ladies in returning call over one another's heads and shoulders scene eleven mr campbell and the others amy it's lovely but it doesn't half do you justice it's too sweet for anything mrs summers why did you let the man put you into that ridiculous seventeenth-century dress? Can't he paint a modern frock? But what exquisite coloring, Mrs. Summers. He's got just your lovely turn of the head. And the way you hold your fan! What character he's thrown into it! And that fall of the skirt, Amy. That skirt is full of character. She discovers Mr. Campbell behind the tea urn. He has Mrs. Summers' light wrap on his shoulders and her fan in his hand, and he alternately hides his blushes with it and coquettishly folds and pats his mouth in a gross caricature of Mrs. Summers' manner. In rising, he twitches his coat forward in a similar burlesque of a lady's management of her skirt. Why, where is Amy Willis? Gone a moment. Some trouble about the hot water. Hot water that you've been getting into? Ah, young man, look me in the eye. Your glass one, Doctor. Why, my dear, has your father got a glass eye? Of course he hasn't. What an idea. I don't know what Mr. Campbell means. I've no doubt he wishes I had a glass eye. Two of them, for that matter. But that isn't answering my question. Where is Mrs. Summers? That was my sister's question, and I did answer it. Have some tea, ladies. I'm glad you like my portrait, and that you think he's got my lovely turn of the head, and the way I hold my fan, and the character of my skirt. But I agree with you that it isn't half as pretty as I am. Oh, what shall we do to him? Prescribe for us, Doctor. No, no. I want the doctor's services myself. I don't want him to give me his medicines. I want him to give me away. You're tired of giving yourself away, then? It's of no use. They won't have me. Who won't? Oh, I'll leave Mrs. Summers to say. Scene 12. Mrs. Summers and the Others Mrs. Summers radiantly reappearing. Say what? She has hidden the traces of her tears from everyone but the ladies by a light application of powder, and she knows that they all know she has been crying, and this makes her a little more smiling. Say what? She addresses the company in general rather than Campbell. Campbell with caricatured tenderness. Say yes. What does he mean, Doctor? Oh, I'm afraid he's passed all surgery. I give him over to you, Mrs. Summers. There now, she wasn't the last to do it. Mrs. Summers with the resolution of a widow. Well, I suppose there's nothing else for it, then. I'll see what can be done for your patient, Doctor. <laughs> 
She passes her hand through Campbell's arm, where he continues to stand behind the tea table. Mrs. Roberts falling upon her and kissing her. Amy, you don't mean it. Mrs. Bemis embracing her in turn. I never can believe it. It is ridiculous. What? Willis. It does seem too nice to be true. You astonish us. We never should have dreamed of it. You must give us time to realize it. Is it possible? Is it possible? They all shake hands with Mrs. Summers in turn. Isn't this rather sudden, Willis? Well, it is for Mrs. Summers, perhaps, but I found it awfully gradual. Nonsense. It's an old story for both of us. Well, what I like about it is it's true, founded on fact. I can't believe it. Well, I don't know whom all this charming incredulity is intended to flatter. But if it's I, I say no, not really at all. It's merely a little coup de théâtre we've been arranging. Lawton patting him on the shoulder. One ahead, as usual. Oh, thank you, Doctor. There are two of us ahead now. I believe you, at any rate. Bravo! He initiates an applause in which all the rest join, while Campbell catches up Mrs. Summers' fan and unfurls it before both their faces. End of Five O'Clock Tea This recording is in the public domain.